Uh, welcome to our talk, um, Ephemeral Environment Practices, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly. I'm Luke Phillips, a staff software engineer at the New York Times. Hey, I'm Dave Grisanti, a principal engineer at the New York Times. And a little about ourselves. Nothing? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, we never moved. We never checked when we were setting Who's it up. Who was there before? You might have to, you might have to exit out. Yeah. Really? You might, <laughs> you might have to exit, exit, escape, and then. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Sweet. All right. Let me know if it goes away again. Um, so yes, talking about our organization at the Times, our mission is to build the essential subscription bundle for every English-speaking curious person who seeks to understand and engage with the world. We are a digital-first experience leaning into technology to produce comprehensive news coverage. News is the Times' most recognizable product, along with others like games, Wordle obviously, but also Crossword, connects, Connections, Strands, and more, cooking, audio, as well as wire cutter and The Athletic. Um, some of the most popular search terms on Google will lead you to the Times. Topics of last week may have generated a lot of traffic for our site and services. These slides and the engineering work here are also proudly union made. We are members of the Times Tech Guild. We stand with our colleagues formerly striking in New York and around the country just a few hours ago. We seek, seek dignified work, stable work conditions, and just cause employment. Feel free to come chat with us anytime throughout the rest of the conference about this. Though our agenda today, um, we're going to talk about our developer platform. We're going to talk about application sets. If you were just in the last talk, uh, we're going to repeat a little bit there. We're going to find new ways to break application sets and better practices as well. But um, part of that experience, creating ephemeral environments, as well as the good, bad, ugly lessons learned along the way. So diving into our platform, let's talk about kind of the desire of an infrastructure and application teams is to do something like an internal developer platform. An IDP is our standardized set of self-service tools and technologies tied together by platform engineers to provide application developers with an easy way to follow the golden path of building and deploying an application. As a platform team, we treat our product and provide it, treat the IDP as our product and provide it as a service to engineers working on applications. As a back-end engineer, this might be my ideal development flow. We simply want to develop code and we want to do what we know best, write excellent quality code, cover it with tests, implement the best patterns to keep the code base maintainable. However, this is more the reality. After writing code or any new feature, you have to worry about containerizing your application, provisioning some infrastructure, building and deploying artifacts, finally networking, monitoring, and observability. Each of these topics is a huge thing on its own, <clears throat> requiring a lot of time, effort, and knowledge, and understanding security and other best practices. This overhead is necessary for the quality of applications, and usually as software development process complexity grows with the size of a company, in bigger organizations, these, there, there might be different teams responsible for different components here as shown on the slide. And you as the app developer might be responsible for figuring out all of the different boxes here. And this is kind of the strategy we find our, behind our developer platform is to automate the creation of a lot of this. What we are building is what we call the Delivery Engineering Shared Platform. And we want to use technology uh, to propel our growth at the, kind, at the times. <clears throat> the Shared Platform, DVSP as we call it, is a centralized set of tools and capabilities that provide developers at the times a seamless and productive developer experience. The platform aims to reduce centralized code management and deployment pipelines, infrastructure to help run our systems in the cloud, and observability tooling to help teams understand and operate their systems. We, today we're going to be focusing mostly just on the Argo CD enablements in the center of this flow. I want to mention one essential part of our infrastructure at the times is our shared managed clusters. They're created and maintained by our delivery engineering group, and Dave and I are part of this uh, group uh, in a sub-team called Application Delivery. Our clusters are built on top of EKS, in addition to multiple services that make the lives of developers easier. These clusters are built as multi-tenant systems. Within these clusters, a tenant is a team within an AWS account, and, it's, and they have all their own resources. A tenant is given one or more 
namespaces that are isolated from other tenants in the cluster. A uh, tenant has appropriate permissions to maintain their application workloads with access to resources in their AWS accounts. There are many architectural options to choose from in Argo, Argo CD, whether it's a standalone instance per cluster, hub and spoke model, instance per logical group, or split instances. You can find uh, some of our previous talks diving into the trade-offs of Argo CD architectures. To be brief, we went with a hub and spoke model, one instance of Argo CD managing all of our named environments, dev, stage, and prod. Um, and our team also has a few other instances of Argo just for our own dev testing. So let's get into some specific Argo CD components as well. Um, again, like you might have seen just in the last talk as well, what is an application? An application is a Kubernetes resource object representing a deployed application instance in an environment. It's really defined by two key pieces of information, a source, a reference of a desired state in Git, a repository of revision, a path, an environment, as well as a destination, reference to the target cluster and namespace. And building on top of that, we're using application sets. Rather than manually create each application instance, you can use an application set to template out applications. This enables both automation and greater flexibility in managing Argo CD applications across a large number of clusters, as well as many repos, many tenants, and it makes self-service a lot easier to deal with. <clears throat> Core to the function uh, core to the functionality of an application set is a generator. Generators are responsible for generating all the parameters, the key value pairs that are substituted into an application template section of an application set. There are multiple generators currently supported by the application set controller as shown here. We typically utilize list and cluster for our named environments, again for our dev stage prod environments. There are a host of benefits to using generators, making complex environments and self-service capabilities easier and possible. Uh, one other implementation detail, as well as many people have seen before, like an app of apps pattern, we also do an app of application sets pattern. This further automates and facilitates our GitOps processes and workflows and making the self-service capabilities of our developer platform possible. Um, Finally, bringing it all together, we have our internal developer platform and Argo CD working together in beautiful GitOps fashion. Thinking about all these stages where a developer could get feedback, rather than wait for a merge to main to create the synchronization to the dev cluster, what if every pull request could have its own environment? Let me hand it over to Dave now. Thanks, Luke. Uh, so as Luke mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, ephemeral environments and the kind of impetus behind why we built them and uh, some of the good and bad uh, that came along with that. So before I get into that, uh, as part of our platform, uh, we have this goal of providing uh, users fully functional services in production in under 10 minutes. I'm not gonna go too much into uh, the, the inner workings of this, but the general idea is that we have this template workflow engine that teams can use, fill out a form, that gives them uh, a Git repository, CI CD pipelines, the uh, Argo project, all the deployment uh, pipelines that they need, uh, integration with Vault for secrets, and uh, place in Kubernetes to deploy their app. And you know this engine is sort of used to get teams up and running to run things in in DevStage and Prod, all the scaffolding they need for their app, uh, you know secrets environment variables, that sort of thing. Uh, so originally when we provided this, uh, teams were sort of like you know kind of chugging along doing work, and as one of the things we got feedback from them was that. They wanted quicker feedback uh, as they iterate on their changes. They didn't want to wait until a pull request was merged uh, and have it see it deployed to dev so that people could see what they were proposing. Like, you know, I don't want to download your PR on my laptop and run it uh, to see what it looks like other than just looking at the code. Uh, so the idea was, you know, as an NYT engineer, um, I can get feedback on a pull request without any approvals or coordinated developments. So we, you know, sort of took this use case internally and talked about how could we uh, provide this with the platform as it stood uh, at the time. Uh, so the idea was to provide this PR-based ephemeral environment uh, by default for any application that's launched on the shared platform. Uh, so we'll probably, I'll probably use, and Luke may do this too, the term ephemeral or PR-based or preview, sometimes we call it. The general idea is you open a pull request, uh, the code that is in that pull request gets deployed into one of our dev clusters, 
and we provide uh, feedback on the pull request comments uh, with a link that you can go look at the live environment. And this usually happens within a few minutes. Uh, so you know, run your tests, build your container, uh, and then it's deployed to dev. Uh, so this was an opt-in feature uh, while people were onboarding when we initially uh, rolled it out. We saw pretty wide adoption of it pretty quickly. Um, it was sort of free to users to say, sure, I'll try this. Why not get PR environments? Uh, and then, like I said, the environment is available within a few minutes of opening the PR. The general workflow was, you know, they push to, to Git, uh, runs tests, uh, builds the container, Argo picks up the uh, Kubernetes YAML, and then, and then deploys it. The uh, maybe a little bit more specific is that sort of uh, push, test, and build, uh, when it went to Git, is following uh, what's considered the rendered manifest pattern that if people are familiar with that, the general idea is our CI tool, in addition to building the container and running the tests, was actually rendering the YAML and checking it into Git. So we're sort of following the GitOps approach here where um, even the PR environments had rendered YAML that was checked into Git someplace, and then that would be deployed and run alongside their dev apps. Uh, so next, let me jump into a little bit of the bad after we uh, release this into the wild. So in the beginning, when we released this, we weren't fully on Argo yet. We were still actually using Drone for many deploys. We were sort of introducing Argo. And uh, Argo was being used mainly for dev things initially. And what the team that was sort of responsible for the workflow stuff did was rendered the YAML and sort of stuck it in the same directory uh, where all the dev apps were being deployed. And what that resulted in was the dev app basically exploded. So that in addition to having dev, it also had every PR that the team was running. Uh, and this is a really bad <laughs> GPT generated picture of Argo, because uh, we didn't have any more around that are still bad. But the teams would just see this like huge screen of possibly hundreds of PRs um, that was alongside their dev app. So in addition to just making the Argo UI really messy, um, it also made it hard for syncing to happen. Because if any of the PRs had any errors in it, uh, it would essentially block the rest of the PRs from syncing and block dev from syncing. Uh, so that was sort of uh, one issue we had, just that sort of general like explosion of the UI. It also made cleanup really hard because Argo would sync whatever was in Git. So if the PR was closed and the process that we added didn't delete the file, now we've got all this extra stuff sort of hanging out uh, that wasn't getting cleaned up. Uh, so. Um, I'm going to switch to like sort of what we did to fix that and then some of the good things that we found by switching to a, like a more pure Argo approach for uh, deploying ephemeral environments. So we first moved uh, PRs to their own folder. Uh, so we basically made folders for each PR with, with the rendered YAML. And we also moved to the Argo PR generator. Uh, so this approach allowed us to only create PRs when a pull request actually exists in addition to using a label on the pull request to say, this is sort of the trigger uh, of you know, when you should deploy. So this way, um, we could sort of turn on or off the feature if we wanted to pretty easily, uh, even if um, the pull requests were still being um, you know, pushed out. And it also allowed teams to remove the label if they wanted to you know, clean up the resources if they weren't using them anymore. And it, it also made the cleanup for us generally easier because we could run an automated job that would remove the PR after uh, some period of inactivity, uh, and then Argo would sort of clean it up without having to worry about the files being there. Um, the only other like last thing that we sort of ran into that we made better with the PR generator, but it's still sort of a, a sticking point, is uh, we have a few teams that use pretty large mono repos, and there's you know maybe 20, 30 services in them, and if they open a PR for one service that doesn't include all of them, um, you know the label gets added to the PR but the rendered manifests may not get generated for any service, and Orgo sort of not gets confused, but it creates apps for every one of the services. And now it gets into this state of like unknown, degraded, with um, it trying to create or sync uh, YAML for, for services that may not have the YAML generated. So what we wanted to do was try to use the merge generator uh, to basically say only deploy, only create an app if the label's there and the YAML is in Git, but the PR generator does not support uh, an extra values parameter, which I'm trying to point out with the arrows there. So that would be great if we could <laughs> get that updated at some point. Uh, we found this feature, out the hard Feature request. Feature request, request. yes. Because Luke and I were like, oh, it'd be great. We'll just do this. And then I tried it, and I was like, this doesn't work. Um, 
so yeah, that's the you know, other than that, it's actually been working out pretty great. Um, we've like cleaned up a lot of things. I think next Luke's going to talk about sort of the the ugly that's still left over. Um, so we still have some some cases of cleanup, but it's definitely made uh, the PRs just like less messy and uh, a little bit more uh, manageable. Um, yeah, I said I already talked about this. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back off to Luke. No, I hate this. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, so getting into, so we've got all the success now that we're using the pull request generator, and so we've, you know, through our success, have been able to introduce a whole new host of possible problems. Um, showing one accident that I had with a pull request generator. Um, so the pull request generator makes a connection directly to your Git. It does not go through the repo server component of Argo CD. Um, so once we had kind of created our uh, application template um, for our IDP and kind of put it in place and rolled it out to all of our services. Um, speaking again of kind of like the mono repos and other uh, types of applications we have, we started to get alerts in our platform that Argo CD was no longer syncing, that work queues were growing, Git updates were, being, uh, were not being received. We had a problem. We had discovered the GitHub API rate limit. Um, how did we get here? Uh, details of the app template itself are not important, but um, in the simple example of what our PR generator config might look like, it looks innocent. When loading into it, when loaded into our IDP and made available to all of our tenants and services, we learned a few things. Uh, when this style of PR generator was applied to a couple of our large monorepo tenants, each service within the monorepo got its own pull request generator, iterating over the same hundreds of open pull requests and snatching hundreds of pull request applications. This caused uh, all sorts of alerts in our Argo C system as the Git requests were blocked, hitting the rate limit. Um, the desired fast requeue re time is a huge red flag here. A lesson learned in attempting to do anything fast in Argo CD is never shorten the queue times. If you need something to respond fast, you need to switch over to using the webhook methods. <clears throat> um, along the way, as we were kind of figuring out things uh, with our uh, GitOps processes and our rendered manifest processes, we caught ourselves in a moment where we would end up creating a bunch of um, instances where pull requests were, were opened, but there was nothing kicking off a GitOps process to say, create the YAML and the rendered YAML rendered manifests needed for that pull request. So all these apps with no config, um, this really creates a fascinating scaling issue with your application controller, hundreds of unknown status apps that are continuously reconciled. Um, so you can kind of see here where you get a, a queue time that is hours in length while the healthy clusters have queue times that are less than a minute. Um, and along with this uh, pattern, your platform may have a cluster dedicated to prod, another s dedicated to stage and test, and another for dev. Add those pull request apps to the dev cluster seems like a good idea, until, until you realize you've instantiated hundreds of more versions of your applications in one cluster versus any of the other clusters. More apparent, this is more apparent in the hub and spoke architecture, though really possible in any of the Argo deployment architectures for any given application itself, application controller that is attached to a specific cluster. Um, that application controller is monitoring the performance of that cluster, and so you have to scale Argo appropriately to deal with that kind of hotspot cluster. As kind of shown here, uh, a random snapshot of one of our platforms and one of the hub and spoke Argo CD instances. Most environment clusters have like say 10,000 objects that it's tracking, yet the PR cluster has 50,000 objects. Um, sizable load for that application controller. Uh, you just have to deal with and be wary of how you're scaling and sharding your application controller. Um, I believe there's like new sharding features that will make some of this better. Uh, but these are all sorts of things to be sure to be aware of um, if you uh, go down this approach. Uh, so. Is, if you'd like to yeah, yeah. Finish, finish it up. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with a few um, summary and uh, questions. I'm not going to ask questions. People have <laughs> questions. Um, so in summary, uh, so ephemeral environments can speed feedback loops and dev processes. It was ve definitely very powerful for us. You know, we're, so we're looking for ways to continue expanding on this and make it uh, more robust. Uh, the Argo PR generator is your friend. Um, Use caution when introducing to a wide audience, as Luke just mentioned, sort of like 
it exploded one of our clusters. It's busier than Prod is. Uh, so obviously we don't want to restrict access to it, but we just you know sort of need to learn how to control it uh, so it doesn't become sort of a dumping ground. Um, SEM provider rate limits can bite you. And also carefully plan your GitOps, IDP, rendered manifests, and Argo CD together. I think we sort of have had this sort of up and down approach to this where we've been figuring it out as we've been moving, um, which I feel like a lot of a lot of people are probably used to, but um, if you can think about some of this stuff ahead of time uh, to give users sort of a better interface, that's uh, the best approach. And then lastly, some related talks uh, for folks who are interested. So at Platform Engineering Day, I actually gave a talk like two hours ago. <laughs> um, that goes m less into Argo CD. I, like, I mentioned Argo CD very briefly, but it, it talks more about um, our IDP and the journey we went on building it. It talks a little bit about approaching the IDP as sort of a product, uh, so if folks are interested in that once the recording comes out. And then later on Thursday, one of our colleagues, uh, Ahmed, is giving a talk uh, about our use of Cilium uh, with some folks, with some of the Cilium maintainers. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you and wrap up. We finished early, so we have three minutes. Yeah, we've got a, a few minutes for questions, if anyone has one. The talk, guys. Uh, quick question: When we deploy pre preview environment, it's like creating duplicate of the same application in the same cluster. If you have multiple pull requests of the same application, you will have like for yep. each pull request, you will have the one. Uh, how you deal with middle tier services? Like if it's not front end service as some middle tier service. Can you can you what type of services? Um, middle tier service, which depends, which needs to sit in the middle. It's like after front end, but before the database, you will need to substitute existing deployment. Multiple backend services. Uh, okay, you're saying like like dependent services, like downstream yes. things. Yeah. Okay. That's sort of up to the team. I mean, I think our assumption is that they're using like a dev in, the dev environment of the thing that they depend on. Like they're not changing their application to necessarily point to. Um, they're not. They're like they're not deploying their own service in a PR plus all the dependent services. They're just deploying their app and calling the dev service that's probably deployed in our own, in the same cluster. Mm -hmm. um, we did actually, which we didn't talk about, we did implement something sort of clever with routing headers and baggage, where if you open a PR and then another application that would be calling you downstream wants to call your pull request environment, um, the way we set up the sort of Istio routing is they could um, just change the URL to be like dash PR number, or pass a header that was like PR number equals, and it would actually route to the pull request version of the app. Um, we haven't seen a ton of usage of that, but it's available if people want to use it. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. We go over here. Hello again. That's, that's actually kind of what I was going to ask. Um, how do you handle routing to the deployed applications? So you have thousands of them. Is there behind a VPN? Are they just IP addresses? Is there a URL that you dynamically create? How do you handle that? Yeah, the, UR the URLs are being, I mean, there's like DNS records created for each, um, for each pull request that's like based on the dev, that's based on the cluster name, the application name, and the PR number. So it's usually like app name dash PR number dot dev, you know, whatever. Do users need to be inside your VPN or inside your own network or use Cloudflare or some, uh, yeah, something you like have, that? Yeah, you have to be on the VPN to yeah. access that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. But if you come to the Cilium talk later this week, <laughs> there'll be more of that discussed as well. Okay. <laughs> you use any external secret or external DNS for that? It's not my question, but that's what we do. Okay. External DNS. Uh, yes, yes. The external, like you're talking about the Kubernetes project, external DNS. Yeah. You, yes, yes. That's how we do work. Yeah. Um, I had a question. It's like we're using the same thing, but we're using charts now, Helm charts, but we're going to move to PR or PR generator. Um, I see you guys are doing the, um, what do you call it, the manifest pattern. Um, so currently, the way we do it is any first when a PR is created, that's when the manifest is picked up and started to deploy. Um, how are you guys doing it? So you wait until after the test to run, then you write the manifest, and then the PR is based off that manifest? Yeah, yeah like the CI process, build process, is like run the test for the app, build the container, render the manifest, and then check the manifest back in, essentially, somewhere else in Git. And then your, uh, your PR is looking for that, 
That's the PR that you're... Yeah, Argo is basically looking, the application set in Argo basically says, any PRs for this app that has this label, like, go, I wanted to, I want to make, that's the application set, I want to make an application in Argo for that app, and the app just happens to be the app name dash the PR number, the label doesn't get added until after the manifest is generated and checked into Git. Okay, because we're, yeah, we're getting into the problem where we don't have that portion. Everything, so it'll deploy everything, but the ECR image isn't up for like 10 minutes. Okay, yeah. All the testing, so that's what I'm, we're we toyed with using the image updater for a little while yeah, at some point. Just but wasn't that's, gonna work for us security-wise. Wasn't, yeah, and that still has to check back into Git. Um, so yeah, we like have sort of a process that it does everything it needs, adds the label, that is the last thing, and that sort of triggers Argo to okay. get started. So we're, we for, add the label before, so we know we wanna do it, so that's what the, we need yeah. to add at the end. Okay, thank you. Oh. Yeah. They're yelling at us in the back. Okay. If you guys want to come up. One, one last, one last. Okay. You, you know about this PR, the, the one the developer creates just before going on vacation, and six months later, the PR is still here. Uh, what's happening for the short-lived environment with long-living PRs? Uh, we, we do a TTL process um, in that GitOps workflow that will also check if a label has been around for more than a week, and we just r remove labels. Um, and that then removes the PR application. The PR itself will exist, but Argo will delete the application. Okay, so the trigger is a week. Sorry. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, part of your GitOps process will constantly trigger and TTL the labels.